water ceremony. What a wonderful example he set for us. Then we see what uh, I think are some of the most dramatic words in the, in the whole New Testament. It don't seem so dramatic in this version of the Bible. I read from the uh, New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. That's what our pew Bible is. Uh, it says, and Jesus stood still. And you don't know if Jesus was just standing there in the crowd and maybe right in front of the man and that's why I could hear him. Other versions of the Bible say, and Jesus stopped. In other words, he was walking along with the crowd in all that chaos and he heard the man and he stopped. Not only the chaos going on around him, just think of what was going on in his mind. Jesus knew that in a, in a week's time he would be uh, persecuted, he would be humiliated, he would be nailed on a cross, and he knew that his reaction to all those things would determine the salvation of everyone, your salvation and mine, all humanity's salvation, who we're going to uh, be obedient to him. That's a lot to have on your mind, isn't it? That's a big weight to have on your shoulders. But he had that on his mind. He had all this noise going on around him, and he heard one lowly beggar off on the side of the road somewhere called Jesus. And he's hurting. And he stopped. What does that mean for you and me? That means that no matter what else is going on, when we cry out to Jesus Christ, he hears us and he stops. And he's willing to do what it takes to help us. Let's step back from that, from that just a bit and put ourselves in the story right there. Uh, let's take on the role of Jesus. We can do that only in a limited way, of course, but uh, we come to be like Jesus in the fact that, well, just as he was busy as he was walking along there, we're busy too, aren't we? We have uh, things to do, important things, places to go. How do we react when we hear the cry of other people? Others who are lonely, and grieving. Maybe some are actually physically hungry. How do we react when we hear those people cry out? Do we take time from our busy schedule? Do we stop and listen and show compassion and do what we can? So you see, the, the, this miracle story gives us two different options that are right before us, aren't they? Jesus stopped the crowd trying to shut the man up. And the, the decision is up to us. What are we going to do? Then Jesus said, call him. I like to think it was the apostles that went out to the crowd and, and, and encouraged the man. And they, they said, be of good courage. They encouraged him. Be of good cheer. He's calling you. Come on, let's go. And it shows us what our job is too, isn't it? To encourage people. When they call out to Jesus, uh, we can't give them sight. We can't do all, solve all their problems. But we can bring them over in front of Jesus Christ. We can, we can do that much, can't we? Now let's go back to the blind beggar. And here is one of the places that Mark, which is the shortest gospel, actually includes more information than some of the other Bible writers do. Uh, Mark said whenever the beggar heard Jesus Christ calling him, he sprang up. I, I love that phrase. He sprang up. He was anxious to get there, wasn't he? I, I don't know how old this man was, but I kind of picture him to be maybe my age or maybe a little bit older. And um, I'll tell you from experience, when you get my age springing up, <laughs> it's not easy to do. But he was anxious to get there. Springing up is not uh, a graceful thing when, when I do it either. Sometimes I spring up, I get up quickly in front of my, my kids and uh, I'll hear them snickering a little bit at me. It's not a pretty sight. And, but this man didn't care. Jesus was calling him. He didn't care what other people said. He didn't care what he looked like. Jesus was calling him. He was going to go. A similar thought uh, in, in the uh, next part of the verse says he threw his cloak aside. That's not included in any of the other gospel accounts, but it is. And this one, Mark must have thought it was very important. That's why he put it there. Well, why do you think he included that? You see, this man didn't have a house. He was a beggar. He didn't have a room in a cheap hotel or a cot in a homeless shelter. They didn't have anything like that. All he had was that cloak. At, at night, he would wrap up in that cloak. That would be his bed. In the daytime, it would protect him from the wind and from the rain and from the sun. 
That was his only possession. Whenever Jesus called him, he didn't fold that cloak up real neatly and hand it to some trustworthy soul and said, uh, would, you, would you hold this for a minute for me? Uh, I need to go talk to Jesus. He threw it aside. So what does that mean? It means when Jesus calls us, when we have the opportunity to come in the presence of Jesus Christ, material possessions, well, they don't mean anything to do that. Next, Jesus Christ asked a question. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Why do you suppose Jesus Christ asked this question? You know, Jesus had this, this uncanny ability to know what was on people's minds. I don't know whether he did it through uh, some supernatural powers that he had or just being able to observe this person's face and their activity one way or the other, we know that Jesus could know what was on people's minds. In fact, everybody in this crowd could probably know what this man wanted. So why did Jesus ask him, what can I do for you? Why did he just say, okay, I'm going to give you sight without asking any questions? Well, I, I think he did that. So this man could express what was on his heart, uh, the deepest desires of his heart. He wanted the man to save himself, didn't he? It's kind of like you know, what Jesus tells us to pray and not give up. And then he, he lets us know that your Father in heaven, why well, he knows what you need before you ask him. But still, he wants us to pray. He wants us to ask. This works out in a different way, too, sometimes. With you and I, sometimes one of our friends, one of our acquaintances will be telling us some of their problems. And right away... Right away, you can see what the problem is. You can see what's causing their problem. Uh, you can see where they went wrong. And a lot of times, you know, we're, we're just so anxious to give them advice. You know, what you need to do is pray more. What you need to do is read the Bible more. We got all this advice that we just throw out right off the bat. To give you another example, I have two daughters. And many times they would come to me and say, Mom, uh, and they'd tell me a story about their boyfriend or their uh, fiance and they tell me what the problem was and how they felt about it. And right off the bat, I could see the problem. Right off the wall, I could see it right away. And I would tell them what the solution would be. I'd say, you need to leave that bum. He's no good. They never did listen to me. What I should have done is uh, I should have asked questions, you see. And I should have helped them work through that uh, for themselves to be able to come to the right solution themselves. So the man does pray to Jesus, speak to Jesus, question Jesus. Lord, he said, let me see. And his sight was restored. Just think of the things that this man could have possibly seen when his sight was restored. It says he followed Jesus into Jerusalem. Did, uh, did this man see Jesus in the garden? Did he see him arrested? Did uh, he see the trial? Did he see Jesus hanging on the cross? Did he see the resurrected Jesus? Did he see one of those 500 who saw Jesus? Uh, did he see Jesus ascend? Did he see tongues of flame whenever Jesus tried pouring out the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't, we don't know. I think from the timing of this, though, up to this point, the apostles had not been able to really understand. And Mark was like saying to us, never fear, have no fear, just as easily as Jesus gave sight to this blind man, he's going to open up the spiritual eyes of the apostles and all those who love him. I think I love this story more and more as my life progresses because more frequently now than ever before, I see myself like that blind beggar uh, sitting on the side of the road not really sure which way to go, what to do next. But when you think about it, that's not really such a bad place to be, is it? You see, that blind man sitting on the side of the road knew that on his own, by himself, he would never have sight again. He had to rely on Jesus. That blind man just had a little bit of faith, but he used that faith to uh, call out to Jesus. That's not a bad place to be after all, is it? It is he who had his sight restored. So 
as we look forward to things that we plan to do next year, please join me in the blind man's prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Open our eyes so that we can see clearly how to follow you into this coming year. Amen. Well, our concluding hymn.